morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming out this morning. We're very fortunate today, uh, not just this morning, but a good chunk of the day, uh, to be hosting uh, Dr. Bev Watford. Uh, and she'll be giving us a couple of presentations. The first one that you're here for, uh, improving your success in NSF proposal submission. And then following that, over the lunch hour, a talk about the broader impacts, broadeni broadening impacts uh, at NSF. Uh, Dr. Bev Watford is currently the director of the NSF's Broadening Participation in Engineering DPE program, uh, engineering director at Wide Initiative dedicated to supporting the development of a diverse and well-prepared workforce of engineering graduates. The BPE program is supporting research on issues associated with diversity within the engineering professoriate, with a particular interest in funding proposals focused on underrepresented racial and ethnic minorities. Uh, Dr. Rockford is currently on leave from Virginia Tech, where she's the professor of engineering education, the associate dean for academic affairs, and the founding director of the Center for the Enhancement of Engineering Diversity for the College of Engineering of Virginia Tech. She has all of her degrees, a bachelor's in mining engineering and MS and PhD in industrial engineering and operations research from Virginia Tech, so has been there for a long time. Uh, and since 1992, she's been heading the center I mentioned earlier, SEED, do you call it SEED? SEED. Um, both Dr. Watford and SEED are extremely highly recognized for their contributions. Dr. Watford has received numerous awards, uh, including recognition from the Women in Engineering Proactive Network, WePAN, uh, for her many contributions there, and is also a fellow of the American Society for Engineering Education. SEED, the center that I mentioned earlier, uh, won an award by, from ABET for its efforts in enhancing diversity, and also received an award from Nesby and ExxonMobil, uh, again, for their extreme success in efforts to improve retention. As I said earlier, we're very, very pleased to have Bev visiting today, and uh, we all have a great deal to learn. So I'm gonna turn over to Bev. I have to make an apology in advance, which is I am interested in improving my success with my NSF proposals, but I also have to be somewhere else at 10 o'clock, so I'm gonna scoot out. Uh, so, thank you, thank you, I've got this, thank you. Good morning, everyone. I want, you I want to thank you for inviting me out here. It's colder here than it is in Washington, okay? And, and yeah. We had great weather in Washington. So um, I've got a couple of things I'm gonna cover today that, that um, have to do with improving your success, but also uh, I, I find one of the things I've found at NSF is that there are a lot of programs that people are completely unaware of. Folks tend to focus on their disciplinary programs and, and they don't see other stuff that's out there that you might be interested in and that you can uh, submit proposals to. So I'm also gonna talk about that first and then I'll get into some stuff about your particular proposal. But there's a lot of information. I'm gonna talk fast. Feel free to stop and interrupt me if there's something that uh, you wanna ask me. So one of the, well, turn it on, turn it on. There you go. So one of the things I wanna do, I find that a lot of newer faculty and faculty not familiar with NSF really don't know the structure of NSF. NSF is very uh, much, I, I, I liken it to an institution where you've got the president and the president or chancellors uh, folks all around, and then you've got these different schools or colleges, and each one represents a different area. This is engineering here. Um, where is size? I can't even see. I'm really close to this. So anyway, there are different directorates, education and human resources, and then within each school or directorate at NSF, you've got different divisions, and each division, and my pointer just died, oh well, each division, again, likened to a department. However, NSF is not hierarchical like a university. So what's known over here is not known over there. We're on completely, and, and you'd think we would know, but we're on different floors, and it's just not like that. Um, so anyway, uh, Pramod Karganakar was here. That's really, I just lost my point of going. Um, he, was, he is here, and he will be here at about 9.30 today. He is the engineering AD the assistant director reporting directly to Dr. Cordova. And within engineering, for example, this would be the engineering directorate. So again, you've got the same type of thing where uh, the dean or the director, the assistant director, Dr. Karganagar, and his staff that report to him. And then, as I said, different divisions or schools underneath the dean. So I'm in EEC, Engineering Education and Centers, but you've got CBET and CMMI, and NSF is nothing if not acronym 
specific, okay? So forgive me for saying things like that, but this is how we're set up. So one of the first ones I'm gonna talk about is RED, and I don't know if you saw this. This was a brand new um, program that came out of engineering education and centers, and it basically focuses on the fact that within engineering, our engineering departments and cultures look about the same as they did 75 years ago, which is kind of sad. Um, and so what we're trying to do is, is encourage departments to really think about how they educate students, what they're teaching students, and how can we change things so that engineering becomes more accessible, more inclusive, so that we bring other people within um, our engineering curriculums. And Red, basically we're looking at this whole program called the Professional Formation of Engineers. And PFE is, from our standpoint, it's a, it's a standpoint, it's a viewpoint where we're not just educating them about engineering theory, but we're also educating them about how to be an engineer. The ethics involved, the teaming and, and activities like that that are involved within. And basically, as I said, create these inclusive communities recognizing that in order to get faculty to change, you have to incentivize them. Faculty do not change just because it's a good thing to do, at least engineering faculty. Um, and I should say at least the ones I know before the rest of you start throwing things at me and saying, oh no, I change all the time. Um, the ones I know don't. Um, cultural barriers that we face within engineering. And again, coherent and technical profession and professional threads. Think about being a professional engineer that are important and that we don't often teach in an engineering curriculum. So RED, was, Red is brand, brand new and it will be another call for proposals uh, next year, probably around the March timeframe. We just, we're in the process of making awards right now. Significant sustainable changes. T-shaped professional skills. T-shaped professional skills deal with the fact that you've got theoretical issues and then you've got pro professional development issues associated with being an engineer. So it's really trying to address that whole engineer of 2020 that came out about five, six years ago um, and try to create students that are of that mindset. There's another program called Scalable Nanotechnology. And again, this is a little specific, but basically what we're looking for is for faculty to investigate issues that will help us overcome the scientific and technical barriers that prevent nanotechnology and useful nanomaterials from scaling up, from, from scaling up. So in this particular case, they have competitive proposals should include training and education of students in nanomanufacturing. It's got to have that as a component. It should be interdisciplinary and it should also have an industry partner, somebody that's going to employ these students. Probably January 2016, that's why I have that question mark there, there'll be a call for proposals in this. They have about $5 million total. Oh, you are so sweet, thank you so much. Got it. Um, and they're making about five to eight awards a year. But that's a program that again, uh, not a lot of people know about because it's within engineering education and centers. It's not in the discipline specific programs. Engineering Research Centers, everybody's heard of Engineering Research Centers. They consider these to be the flagship of the engineering directorate. They are multi-year, multi-million dollar research centers involving multiple institutions. Um, the actual issues associated with or, or things associated with them are the engineered systems vision. You've got research that is culminating in something practical, something practical that all these different research areas will feed into. You've got a university and pre-college education system. They're concerned about the innovation ecosystem, teaching students how to be innovative, how to be creative, how to be entrepreneurial. There's a very strong industry component to en engineering research centers. A culture of inclusivity, ob obviously, and we're expecting to make awards. We, we keep saying spring, summer. I think by the end of June, we'll know who the awardees are this year, and we'll be, it'll be publicly announced. But typically, they make about three or four awards every couple of years. And again, it's $40 million over 10 years. These are very, very large scale um, endeavors. Of course, I need to turn this one on too. Okay, that will work. And we'll just hit the button. Research and engineering education. So engineering education is a fairly new field um, developed in the first engineering education program was actually created in 2004 at Purdue. 
Um, we like to say that Virginia Tech was 10 seconds later, but being second is just not as good as being first. So, um, But basically we're looking at, in this particular case, research and engi engineering education is all kinds of things associated with how we educate engineering students, both pre-college and undergraduate. So you're looking at stuff like diversifying pathways. How do we encourage more transfer students to pursue engineering degrees? How do we uh, explore credentialing? We've got all these veterans that are coming back from um, the wars with a set, a skill set that we don't know how to give them credit for. And it doesn't make sense sometimes for them to follow the traditional path of an 18-year-old into an engineering curriculum when they've got a skill set that we can capitalize on. And these are just some examples. How to scale engineering education initiatives. They call it the valley of death. We basically have developed all these different methodologies that we know improve learning. How do we get engineering faculty members to completely overhaul their classes to include these new techniques? It's not happening. It's not happening. It's, you don't have time. Um, typically, you don't have time while you're teaching, and during the summer, you're doing research. So again, it's, it's uh, an issue that we need to deal with. Uh, advancing learning within the broader ecosystems, the things like innovation and globalization. Sustainability education. How do we incorporate these things into an already jam-packed undergraduate curriculum? Um, I know at Virginia Tech, and again, forgive me if my examples are from Virginia Tech, it's about the only school I've ever been at. Uh, we have 136 credit hours in uh, a curriculum where, and again, most of the other degree programs at Virginia Tech are 120 or less. So how are we supposed to add more to that to incorporate these things? Um, developing engineering specific learning theories, et cetera. Proposals are typically due, we, we will have a call for proposals due in September, then January, then the third Thursday in January and September after that. And one of the issues is that you have to understand educational theory. And that's not necessarily something that engineers are educated in. But we have, come on, all right, just push the button, I guess. Well, I'll, I'll come to another one. There is another program that we've got that can help people become uh, learn how to develop a research and engineering education proposal. This program, the Broadening Participation in Engineering program, is one that I'm running. It's within the AD's office, so it covers all the, the entire engineering directorate. And it's really very broad. One of the things that I've been able to do that I have enjoyed is I've actually had, instead of a solicitation, I've actually had a program description. And just to give you basic difference, a solicitation is very rigid. It tells you exactly what you must do. A program description has a little bit more leeway. I don't include things like how much money you can, you know, what the money limit is or number of proposals per institution, anything like that. So this year, I decided that I was going to focus on diversity in the engineering professoriate. Why are we having so much trouble diversifying engineering faculty? And in fact, in the program description, I, I put in there that in 2012, something like 408 underrepresented minorities got doctoral degrees in engineering. But when you looked at the difference between 2012 faculty and 2013 faculty, only 28 additional underrepresented people joined engineering faculties across the country. So they're obviously going someplace else. They're going into industry, they're doing other things, and the question is why? When we have such a great opportunity to educate and to teach, and I personally think it's a great job, why don't people want to do it? What is, what are we driving, why are we driving them away from engineering? So, but. In this particular case, all these things fall into um, broadening participation, differential participation rates in engineering, varied experiences and interaction of students from diverse groups. It's not the same for everybody at the same institution even. So broadening participation in engineering, we had about $6 million this past year. I'm actually reviewing proposals right now. They, I had panels about a month ago, and I'll be announcing awards sometime within the next month or two months. But it was really interesting because one of the problems with broadening participation is that the community has long been an implementation community. They've basically said, okay, you want me to broaden participation, you want me to encourage underrepresented students to go into engineering, let me implement a summer camp and that'll do it. Let me implement a, a residential community for women that will support women's retention in engineering. So it's been implementation. It has not been research. And when I threw this out there and basically said, we are looking for research. I'm not looking for you to tell me, 
I want to implement this faculty mentoring program and faculty recruitment program that's going to bring these people into my college and help them be retained. No, that's not what we wanted. We wanted research. Why are we having so much trouble? Half the proposals I got were implementation. They didn't have a research question that you could make up. It was very depressing. It was very, very depressing. So it obviously shows that the community does not know what to do. And one of the things that, that came out of that, and actually it's a good thing, is that we're going to, I don't know if anyone's familiar with um, the engineering education colloquy that we held back in 2006. We basically, engineering education, again, a nascent field, didn't know what to do either. What are we supposed to be researching? So we actually brought together um, 75 people from across the country, put them into a three-day retreat where we defined this is what engineering education research is. These are the topic areas, these are the broad um, subject areas that we want people to investigate. And we're still using that as guidelines for telling us where to look and what to investigate. We're going to do the same thing for broadening participation because people obviously just don't know what to do. EFRI is an interesting um, uh, solicitation. Emerging Frontiers in Research and Innovation. Basically, one of the things that they do, and I found this so interesting, I went to a couple of them, they've been holding for the last three or four months these seminars or discussion groups at NSF to try and figure out what's going to be next year's EFRI topic. And people are proposing all kinds of things. So when they did this last year, it was this two-dimensional atomic layer research and engineering, of which, let me just tell you, I know nothing about. Not my field, but there's a whole bunch of people that apparently do work in this area, and it's real cutting edge and real interdisciplinary. So every schedule, they have a letter of intent due in November. There's a preliminary proposal in January, and then a full proposal due in April. And that's the topic area, this two-dimensional activities. So, and they change it every year. One of the nice things about EFRI is if you get an EFRI award, they have something called EFRI REM, Research Experiences in Mentoring, where you can apply for a $100,000 supplement that you can use to fund teachers, undergrad, and or high school students during the summer in your lab. So it's got a really nice supplement associated with it. But again, the topics tend to be very unique. Maybe that's a good word. REUs, REUs, there are, there are many programs at NSF that are NSF-wide, okay? They cross all the different disciplines. They happen to be housed within engineering education and center. So REUs, as you probably know, are research experiences for undergraduates. Typically, they run about $1,200 per student per week. It's really very much focused on the student support, the mentoring of the student, the bringing them to your campus, um, that, memo, that MOU, we basically um, run the program in conjunction with the Air Force Research Group, and they give us money to help increase the number of REUs that we can offer, number of proposals we can uh, uh, pro provide funding for. Supplements, just about every NSF program where if you have an NSF award, you can apply for a supplement to add an undergraduate student to your award. Supplements tend to be five, seven thousand dollars, something along those lines. It can be academic year, it can be summer. There are some programs, and I, I, a colleague of mine was funny because he said he got a supplement proposal and it really wasn't very good. And so he declined it. And his boss came to him and said, What are you doing? And he said, Well, this wasn't very good. And the boss said, We don't decline these. <laughs> so I just thought that was very interesting. Um, anyway, if you're going to, if you have Antarctica money, it's due the fourth Friday in May. For everybody else, it's the fourth Wednesday in August for the, for the um, REU sites. And a site is typically, you're running a site with somewhere between six to 10 students. It's often during the summer, typically eight to 10 weeks during the summer. And again, it depends on your institution. I know you guys are on quarters, so that might be a little different uh, time frame. But it's a very, very nice program. Very, very nice program. And then there's another one, RETs, where you do the same thing with teachers. So in, again, the type of activity that you're doing is you're inviting pre-college teachers into your laboratory to do work, to learn about what you're doing, to figure out how to take what you're doing and condense it down to something that they can introduce their own students to in the pre-college environment. So typically, it's you can get $600,000 for three years, or you can get supplements, $10,000 per teacher per year. And again, the supplement would be if you have an existing NSF award. I saw 
I was at a, a site visit for an ERC a couple of weeks ago, and they actually brought one of their REP participants in. And it was fascinating how she had taken working in the laboratory and learning about um, the, the research that they were doing and actually taking it to they, her school, and admittedly it was a very special school, but her school allowed her to convert a classroom into this laboratory where the students were doing etching of nanochips and, and layering of stuff. It, it was so, and the, the students were just enthralled with it. It was amazing. And that's how we broaden participation. That's how we tell and excite people about engineering, is by involving them in these types of activities at an early stage. So again, the deadline is November um, 2015 or 2016, 2017. It just keeps on going. And it can be also, you know, as community college faculty as well. So you can start establishing relationships with community college faculty, which can be great for recruiting. This is what I was talking about when I mentioned if you are not familiar with engineering educational research. This PFE, Professional Formation of Engineers, we're, we're, that's kind of our umbrella now. We're looking, we've created now this research initiation program. So you can apply March 31st, 2016, you can get up to $150,000 to learn how to be an engineering education researcher. If there's something, you're an electrical engineer, you are um, a, a mechanical engineer, but you want to do some kind of educational research with your students, what this requires you to do is you must um, collaborate with some colleague in the learning and cognitive sciences, an education person from the, from the School of Education or College of Education, who understands those theories. I like to say engineers tend to be very arrogant about things, and we really feel that you just don't understand engineering if you're not one. Okay. So what this does is it makes them recognize that, okay, fine, you understand engineering, you don't understand educational research, so find somebody that does. Partner with them. Develop, your, develop this research expertise, the hope being that once you successfully complete one of these projects, you can then apply for the REE, the Research and Engineering Education, either with a partner or on your own. And those awards tend to be, they can be upwards of 500,000, 600,000, up, I've seen awards over a million for engineering education research activities. So again, we've got different, some different examples of topics, building pathways into engineering, developing methods that characterize the different aspects of professional formation, creating a culture of lifelong learning, all kinds of different topics. And these are just examples. These are not be all and end all. But again, it requires that kind of a partnership. I think I like this one um, because we, we deal a lot with engineering ethics and how we are required by our accreditation agency to have ethics incorporated in our curricula. So what this does is, this is all seven directorates, and what they're looking for is proposals that focus on forming ethical STEM researchers in all fields of science and engineering. What exactly, do, what, what constitutes responsible or irresponsible behavior? What cultural and institutional context will promote ethical behavior in our students? Okay, do certain labs have a culture of academic integrity versus others, and why? Why is it like that? So maximum award, $600,000 for five years, four hundred dollars for three years, and the proposals are due um, way, way in the future. Okay, just way, way, way in the future. Not, not in your lifetime. I apologize for that. 2016. So now, okay, so these, I don't know if you noticed, I've been trying to do this at the bottom. So these are all programs within the Division of Education and Ed Engineering Education and Centers. This one here, the ethical uh, program, is within the Social and Economic Sciences Division. I'm going to talk to you now about some that are in the Education and Human Resources Division that you might be interested in. EHR core research is not very old. It's been in place about a year and a half to two years. And again, what they're looking for is research that focuses on STEM learning, STEM learning environments, workforce development, and broadening participation in STEM. They've actually got a lot of money. I mean, it's an obscene amount of money that they've got upstairs. This is on the eighth floor. They're looking at integration across all four areas, advances in fundamental research on STEM learning, not help me implement this summer camp or develop a mentoring program. They're interested in research. They've got different funding levels. 
diff, uh, based on the different type, they've actually got some pilot projects and then they've got some full-blown projects. September 10th and the second Thursday in September after that. So again, the, these are things, fundamental research on human learning in STEM, learning in STEM learning environments, et cetera, et cetera. Here are the tracks. Engage student learning, which basically focuses on the design and development of studies or the implementation of specific tools, resources, and models. Or the institution and community transformation track, where they use innovative approaches to substantially increase the use of highly effective methods for teaching and learning in STEM. Okay, how do we scale these things? That's a big problem with our community, is, is scaling up the innovations that we have. Scholarships in STEM, S-STEM, um, this is another program. This, this one is interesting. It's actually funded off of fees from H-1B visas. So as you can imagine, they have a lot of money. And what they do, it's, it's funding to give scholarships to undergraduate or and graduate students. It could also be at the graduate level. The issue is a couple of things. There must be financial need, which basically says it also must be a US citizen if you have financial need. And it's not the scholarship, the awarding of scholarships that really the proposal is about. Anybody can award a scholarship. Anybody can arrange for financial aid to give somebody money. It's more about if you are giving scholarships to students, what are the programs that you are putting into place that will make sure the students are successful and maintain their scholarship? Now, there's some restrictions on this particular program. The, the call for proposals is in August each year. Restrictions include things like um, you can have multiple proposals coming from a broad institution. So you could have one coming from your school of, let me get it wrong, computer, computing and information sciences. Is that right? I was close. I had it a little backwards. And another proposal coming from the, the school of engineering. But you can't have two proposals coming from the school of engineering. So each kind of unit within the institution can have their own proposal. And I can tell you, it, it, there's really not, I have seen, again, Virginia Tech, the College of Engineering had one and the College of Science had one. So it, there's no viewpoint like that. They split them up by discipline, so they're viewed independently. But it's up to 600,000 for five years. You can give awards up to $10,000 per student per year. And it's all scholarship money. They will allow you to have maybe 15% in administrative types of things, but there's no overhead, that's it. Very strictly scholarship. That's a very nice program. There's an HSI initiative. Um, Sharnia told me that, that UC Irvine is on its way to becoming a Hispanic-serving institution, um, with like many here in California. The HSI initiative is interesting. There, there are many different funding mechanisms at NSF within EHR that target HBCUs. There's a program called HBCU Up. There's another one called TCUP, which targets tribal colleges. There is no standing program that focuses on Hispanic serving institutions. That's long been a bone of contention for many individuals. So what they did was they basically said, if you wish to submit a proposal to any of these listed programs, the LSAMP, the ATE, STEM, any of these, where the focus is on a Hispanic serving institution, you designate that and they've actually got some set aside funds that will help support funding of those proposals. So it's, it's again, uh, Congress sets our budget and up until this time, Congress has not saw fit to allow budgeting for Hispanic serving institutions the way that it has happened for other uh, MSIs, minority serving institutions. Proposals are typically due May and October and you can, as I said, this is a way to uh, support Hispanic students um, or HSIs, two and four year institutions. Career award, as, as I understand the panel today or the discussion at lunch, or is this this one? This one, the panel today. We'll talk about career awards. They're due every July. Um, one of the interesting things that I don't know if you're aware of, and it, it is actually very important, they have changed the letters of collaboration. They have made it so that this year, the letters of collaboration may contain one sentence and they tell you in the solicitation what that sentence is. We've actually gone back and forth because I wanted to make sure to get clarification because my office typically writes a lot of letters of collaboration for career uh, proposals. And what it's done is 
typically, my letters of collaboration, I can describe the diversity programs and the outreach programs that we have in my office in the letter. I can't do that anymore. That information now must be contained within the proposal. And for people that are counting every single word on the 15 pages that you got, that's got some people a little upset. But what they're trying to do is, I understand it, and I talked to some people about this, they're really trying to make the education and outreach component of the career award more integrated with the research that the faculty member's doing. So literally, these letters have one single sentence, and that sentence is in the solicitation. They tell you exactly what to say. And then obviously, if you want a, a career award, you're eligible for a P case, which is a very select group of career awardees. They get to meet the president, which is really kind of cool. Advance, I understand you had an advance here, so I'll just gloss over this one real quick. Basically, advance was to address the lack of participation of women in administrative levels within institutions. And so they have the ins Institutional Transformation Awards that worked at, um, worked at examining the system to number one, figure out why is this a problem? Why aren't women advancing into these upper levels? And then to figure out how to do it. I think the better part of advance that has happened is that advance has actually, in most cases, created policies and actions that have benefited all people, not just women. And I find that to be really interesting. One of the things that happened at Virginia Tech, and it took 10 years to really become commonplace, is um, the, the leave, family leave, and the stopping of the tenure clock. And up until a certain point, basically, it was only women that asked to do this because we were the ones that got pregnant and we were the ones that had to have the kids. And the men weren't involved at all, I guess. Immaculate conception or something, I don't know. Um, but what's happened is it's become so commonplace and we talk about it so much that when I was an, I was an acting department head, one of my faculty members whose wife was having a difficult pregnancy came to me and said, I need some time off. And it was really neat to have that happen, to watch him take a semester off to support his family. So different things, it's not just supporting women, it's changing the environment and the culture so that it supports and promotes all individuals. Okay, so anyway, um, if you've had an advanced institutional transformation, you can't get another one, so don't worry about that. But you could get a Catalyst Award, which is to conduct self-assessment or implement unique strategies. Um, that's another thing that's happening now. i -Corps. Very briefly, i is focused on, there's a big push these days on entrepreneurialism. How to take what you're doing and make it readily available to other people, commercialize it. So i -Corps, Innovation Core, is exactly that. We've got nodes and um, i -Corps teams, et cetera. And what they're trying to do is help faculty members navigate that really, really interesting pathway between intellectual property and how to commercialize what you're doing, take what you're doing in the lab and actually get it out to the public. So that's another um, uh, NSF-wide program that is that crosses boundaries. It's basically any discipline. So let me mention this briefly. Includes is something that's now in the 2016 budget. It is very briefly mentioned, and what we're trying to do right now is define it. All we know is that INCLUDES basically is trying to mobilize STEM research to broaden participation. The way that we're looking at it is we have been addressing this problem of broadening participation for over 30 years. And we have not, we've made progress. I'm not going to say we haven't made progress. We've made a lot of progress. The fact that I'm standing here is progress. However, we have not made sufficient progress and it's really slow. So the idea about INCLUDES is to figure out what is it that we have to do and I'm going to talk about this more at lunch when I talk about the broadening impacts, but we're going to be looking for two, they've got $15 million in FY16, and it looks like that's going to increase dramatically in subsequent years. But looking at what are the networks for STEM excellence, and what, are, what can we do to empower all youth to pursue STEM careers? And again, this is not just focused on engineering, it's a STEM initiative. The whole issue, the things that we're going to be looking at are things, and I'll, as I said, I'll talk about this at lunch, scalability. We've got a lot of local successes. How do we get those to scale? Um, issues of things like collective, imp uh, collective impact and sustainability. 
So that's includes, and as I said, I'll, I'll talk about that a lot more at lunch, and that's, that's really going to be a very interesting, um, if not long, acronym. So skip that. I'm going to go straight to this one. This is, I'm going to give you a, I've got about 15 minutes till my boss walks in. How to improve your proposal. This is going to be really basic, okay? But, and, but one of the things that I find is that proposal writing is supposed to be fairly basic. You've got goals. Identify them. You have a rationale. Who cares whether you get the money to do this or not? Because if nobody cares, we're not going to give you the money. It's got to be important. The project description, tell me what you're going to do. The evaluation, how are you going to know you did it? And then the dissemination. Are you going to tell other people what you just did? Okay, Very basic proposal writing. So first thing I'm going to tell you, please read the program description. I can't tell you how many people have called me up with questions. And I really I want to put on my teacher hat and say, excuse me, did you read the assignment? Okay, but you can't say that because people get a little testy about that and then they call you boss and stuff. But determine how do your ideas match the solicitation. How can you improve that match? How can you make your idea really, really fit with what's being requested? Articulate your goals, your objectives, and your outcomes. You got to build on the existing knowledge base. And this is, this is the who has done what in this area already. Why? Are you proposing to do what you're doing? How did you reach that conclusion that this was going to be a good idea? Is it doable? And is it the best approach? You've got to be able to convince somebody that, number one, if we give you the money, you can really do this. And based on your expertise and your knowledge in the field, it is the best and most promising approach that you can come up with. You have to convince people of this. Emphasize what's new and what's being adapted. Identify strategies for contributing to the knowledge base. Please define a dissemination plan. And dissemination is not just publishing papers. There's a lot more to it than that that you could do that would make your proposal stand out compared to others. And that's what you're trying to do. Everybody in this room is submitting proposals. What you want is for yours to be better than everybody else's, for people to notice yours over everybody else's. It might not be for the quality of the intellectual merit. It might be other things that people say, well, that was really cool what they were doing, and I think that this is the one that should be funded. Think about the broader impacts. Collaborate with people. That's often a positive type of thing, especially if the expertise that you're trying to show is not something that you can show you have. Okay, So think about that. Be more specific in your publication, and we talked about this. Identify and indicate the specific conferences or journals. Don't just say, I'm going to write three conference papers and two journal articles. Where are you going to get them published? Where do you want to get them published? I keep hearing nature all the time. Nature's supposed to be, I guess, like the big thing, whatever. My field is Journal of Engineering Education. Okay, If you get published in there, you're gold. Include things in your budget. When I first, before I started working for NSF, I used to submit proposals thinking, oh gosh, I need to really pare this budget down because the cheaper I make it, the more positive the response will be. No, that is not true. We actually look at stuff and say, there is no way they can do that for that amount of money. They don't know what they're talking about. Ask for exactly what you need. And in fact, what I tell people, if there's a dollar limit on the budget, ignore that. Ignore that. Develop the budget without a dollar limit in mind. Then go back and say, OK, I am now $100,000 over. What can I cut? What can I reduce to make sure I fall within the limit? But at least you know you thought of everything you needed to be successful on the project. Because sometimes that really tells a lot. Um, explore other venues. It's not just, you know, there's, there are all kinds of science news publications, the lay press, professional societies, NPR. I know our um, news and public relations person, oh my gosh, she gets so excited when people are on NPR. That's like, oh, the best thing possible in the world. So think of other things like that. In terms of the review process, how many of you review proposals? OK, so you were there. You know. They give you 10, 12, 14 proposals. You've got often two, maybe three weeks before the panel to read them, and you wait till the last weekend. 
You know you do. So you're, you're running through these things, running, 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 okay? So it's a limited time. You basically try to spend maybe 20 minutes to maybe 30 minutes going through this proposal. You want to get the general ideas. This is what people are doing. They are different types of experiences in the panel. Panels will have seasoned reviewers. They will have brand new reviewers because we're always trying to expand the review pool. They will have people who are in your specific area of research, that really narrow area that you're in. And then they'll have people that are in a related area that know a little bit about this, but they know more about this stuff. Okay, different levels of knowledge. We come, you bring the people to a panel and you discuss the merits of the, the proposal. And it's a shared experience. Everybody contributes to the discussion. So what you want to do is for heaven's sake, please use good style, clarity, organization of your document. Be concise, but be complete. Write simply, avoid jargon and acronyms. We do not understand them. Or worse yet, you put one in there and somebody thinks it's something else. And that's really messed up. Okay, so you don't want, describe it, then give the acronym, and then you can use it from that point on. But don't use the acronym all throughout and then figure, oh, they'll read it in the appendix or somewhere like that. Do not trust Word. Ever. Ever, ever, ever. And in fact, don't trust your colleagues, okay? Find somebody that knows absolutely nothing about what you do. Give them, you know, if it's a grad student, give them 20 bucks, say, please read this, okay? And, and tell me if you understand what I'm trying to do. Because again, we see what we thought we wrote. And our colleagues see the same thing. So find somebody else to read your proposal. They will catch your grammar, they will catch the sentences that don't really mean much and that they don't understand, okay? Use a friendly structure, subject headings, short paragraphs, bullets. Don't overdo stuff. I, I, you know, the things I remember. I was in a panel one time and the reviewer, by about the fourth page, had at least 25, 30 times used a parenthetical phrase. And we were all looking at each other going, yeah, it's just pissing me off. Okay, I don't want to read it. Don't do stuff like that. It's not good. Don't boldface every other word. Okay, don't bullet everything. Reinforce your ideas. I still remember, gosh, it's been so long ago, my advisor telling me as I'm writing my dissertation, two things. Kiss, which is keep it simple, stupid. And stupid was me, okay? And the other thing was tell them what you're going to tell them. Tell them. And tell them what you told them. Your advisor told you the same thing, right? It's, I'm, you have no idea how sometimes you're, you're halfway through a proposal going, I don't know where this is going. I just, and I can't, I can't put this stuff in context because I don't know where it's going. Give examples. Examples are good. If you are putting a graphic in your proposal, ask someone to look at it and ask if they understand what the graphic is supposed to be saying. And again, it, this is one of those things, you know, t as teachers, we laugh over the assignments sometimes that we get from students. You know, we just look at it and just go, you know, this is really funny. And we, we show it to colleagues. We do the same thing with your proposal. Okay, I just want you to know. It's like, you have got to see this graphic they put in here. Okay, the same thing. Please get somebody else to look at it. Okay, appropriate level of detail. You don't have, you don't want to get too much. You don't want to give too little. You only have 15 pages. And that's really, a lot of times, not enough. So be careful with that. Follow the solicitation and the GPG. Um, they, there was a study that was done in the engineering on the proposal submitted to engineering, and it was some obscene percentage, like 28% were being returned without review. That's the last thing you want to have happen to the work that you spent a month or so doing, two months doing. Adhere to the page size. Yes, you go into 16 pages, it's returned without review. Nobody's going to look at it. Font size, margin limitations, all those things. Use the allotted space. Don't pad the proposal. Don't think that you have to have 15 pages. If you can say it in 11, we really like you. Use appendices sparingly. In fact, there are some solicitations that tell you flat out you cannot use appendices. Don't put in 
a, a web link if it's something critical to what you're talking about. Because again, I'm not gonna check the website, sorry. Everything that I need to know should be in the 15 pages that you're submitting to me. Um, include letters that show commitment. And again, this was one of those things that makes you laugh. You know, you're looking at two letters and, and you put them like this and everything's the same except the signature at the bottom. And it's like, yeah, those people really cared about th what this person was doing. If you have to, and I, I tell people this, write the letter for them. Okay, so that you can make sure that person X gets this letter and person Y gets that letter. And then they can tailor it the way that they want. Pay special attention to your project summary. It is the first thing that's read, and often in many programs, the project summary is what, what is used to put your proposal into different panels. They'll group things by topic, by, by what they're looking at, so you don't want your proposal to end up in the wrong panel. So pay attention to that particular project summary that you're providing. And again, NSF now forces you to do the whole summary intellectual merit broader impact thing, so you don't have to worry about that as much. But be explicit and have those things be independent. The intellectual merit and the broader impact should not be the same thing. Prepare a credible, credible budget, I, and I said this before, consistent with the scope. Please justify your budget. I like people that actually, and you know what, the NSF budgets look exactly the same. I like people that say, 1F, and here's the justification for 1F. This is what that money's for. 1G, this is what that money's for. You know, consultant, this is what that money's for. Make it easy to figure out. Otherwise, people are gonna look and say, what is that money for and why do they need it? And you don't want them doing that. Address prior funding when appropriate. And again, this is also something that's, that's changed in the last couple of years. It's not just prior NSF funding. We wanna know what were the outcomes. What were the outcomes? We don't wanna know what you got funded. We wanna know what happened with the money that you got. Emphasize the results. Sell your ideas, address the review criteria. Often within um, the solicitation, there are specific review criteria that are in, in addition to the merit review criteria put out there by NSF. Don't make assumptions about your audience. I already talked about proofreading it. Oh, did I say this already? Read the solicitation and the GPG. Please, read them. Get advice. One of the things that you can do, and, and most NSF program directors were very happy to get information from you. Now, I will say this. I had a gentleman send me seven pages, which I promptly sent back. I do not preview proposals. I will discuss ideas and concepts. So you can send me a paragraph or two, even a half a page to a page, and I'll take a look at it, and I'll send it back to you, or, or then I'll, I might send you an email and say, okay, give me a call at this time and let's talk about this. Use an imaginary panel. There are some institutions I know that do this as a rule for career proposals, et cetera. They'll actually have a panel come and they'll convene a panel and ask people to preview and review the career proposals that are going out there. And use your judgment about things. Don't let somebody tell you, you have to have this in the proposal, and if you don't, it won't get funded. If it doesn't make sense with what you're proposing, keep it out. Don't include it. So again, the goals. Very simple question to me. What are you trying to accomplish, and what do you expect the outcome to be? The rationale, why do you think it's a good idea? Why is it an important problem to solve? That's the who cares. And why do you think your approach is going to be able to solve this problem or to find out this information? The evaluation, how are you going to manage the project to ensure that it's successful? How will you know if you are successful? Because if you can't answer that question, then you will never know and you'll just keep spinning your wheels like a hamster. How will others find out about your work? How are you going to interest them in what your outcomes are? How are you going to get them excited about what you've done? One of the things I had a, a, a student do, we were funding some graduate students, and the, the key is in a lot of cases, it's not just your peers that you're trying to get to understand what you're doing. We respond and we report to Congress. We have to justify, and if you've been following the news, there's a lot of stuff out there right now that's not real good in, in terms of how Congress is looking at NSF and NSF's budget. We need to make 
everybody, the general population, realize the value of the work that you're doing, even if the value might be 14 steps down. If what you're doing is not done, we will never get there. Help people to understand that. That's really important about the value of your work. Other interactions, and this is my last slide. Um, being a panelist, any faculty level, assistant professors, associate professors, full professors can be panelists. Sometimes AP faculty, you don't even have to have a tenure track position. It's based on expertise. Often the programs will have um, a button where you can actually do a web sign up. You can submit your name and say, I'd like to review for these proposals. Or send the program manager an email with a short bio. And in fact, what, they t what I've been told is um, keywords about your expertise. As short of the better. What are your fields of interest? What are your research expertise? Sign up for emails. There's a funding opportunities page on many, on many of the division websites. You can get information sent to you automatically about program announcements from that division, about upcoming due dates. You can be a rotator, which I am. Um, tenured associate, they tend not to have assistant professors rotate. That's just not a good career move. So tenured associate and above, you're on leave from the institution, but the interesting thing is my, what happens is NSF gives my institution a grant for my salary. So I am still being paid by Virginia Tech. I still work for Virginia Tech. My leave is the same. My retirement's the same. And as my husband, who's fighting with the county of Arlington over the fact that my car is parked up there, they can't prove that I don't work and live in Blacksburg. Okay, yeah, I let my husband deal with that. He fights with the IRS too. It's like, it's whatever. Um, you get a stipend, and you also get IRD. IRD, Independent Research and Development, is time that NSF gives you to return back to your institution to keep things going. Your graduate students, your lab, they give 50 days a year. You can do things virtually by phone. It's really a, it's really a good a good deal. And I see my boss standing back there, and I want to go ahead and stop talking and let him come on up here. So anyway, that's all I had to say. I hope that I gave you some information that was useful. So thank you. Hello. I'm just fine. Good morning, everyone. My name is Sharnia Artis. I'm the director for the Office of Access and Inclusion, which is a joint office in the Samueli School of Engineering and Bryn School of Information Computer Science. I invited a couple of faculty uh, members who have received career awards to serve as panelists. So at this time, if you want to come up um, to the front to be on the panel. We actually had um, a couple cancellations this morning. So if there are any other career award winners in the audience, that would like to share their experience, I would like to invite you up as well. Or not, since or not. I'm not one, um, but she but asked me to serve. Invite, <laughs> yes, I also invited Bev to, to be on the panel. All right. So we're gonna have some brief remarks. All right, oh, thank you so much for coming. Good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm sorry I missed the morning part of the session because I was in some other meetings here. Uh, what I thought I might do is just offer a few comments and then maybe take some questions. Deb, is, would that work? Or would that be good? Um, I just want to uh, say that number one, the engineering directorate is deeply committed to the career program. And one example of that is we just announced our 2015 career award winners. We gave out 146 career awards. Uh, we increased the uh, grant amount from 400,000 to 500,000 uh, and kept the number of awards essentially the same. So our total investment in FY15 was $73 million. Our typical budget for career award is on the range of 52, 55, 54 million. That's what we, we budget. But we always end up spending a lot more than we budget. Uh, and the reason is this deep commitment to the career program that 
uh, the junior faculty are the future, and we want to make sure that every really good proposal that is submitted by junior faculty members is actually awarded. Second point I would, so that's sort of the overall uh, picture in terms of commitment to the career program, and it's unwavering, so it's not going to change, so we would very much encourage uh, junior faculty to continue to write career award, uh, proposals. The second point I would make is the concept uh, of career program and how you want to think about it. Uh, the, the, so the main idea is the scholar-teacher model. That is, we want the career award to lay the foundations for long-term faculty career, faculty life, which is called the career award is we're really trying to lay the foundations for the long-term career. So if you think about the work of a faculty member, uh, we do research, we do teaching, we mentor students, uh, and we do some professional service. So that, that's sort of the typical work of a, of a faculty member. So what we are encouraging in the career program is, especially at very early stages of a faculty member's career, to think holistically about your professional future as a faculty member and not have your teaching life and your research life be in two silos, but really have, an, have a holistic view of how your research uh, helps with your teaching and how your teaching helps with your research. Uh, whether that's undergraduate teaching, whether that's graduate teaching, whether that's mentoring of your PhD students. So the more uh, holistically you think about the research life and the teaching life, the better your career proposal will turn out to be. So there are, I'm sure, they have told you all, uh, about lots and lots of things. So all of that is very important, but uh, the point I want to emphasize is to have this holistic view. So you should be taking a step back and thinking for the long term and saying, how do I want to spend the next five years of my career, faculty life so that I build a very strong foundation for long-term success as a professor? So how do I get really good at teaching? How do I really get good at research? How do I integrate the two so that my intellectual life is, uh, is benefiting both sides? So that's a very, very important part of the career uh, program and that the panelists uh, pay great attention to. Um, and I think I'll stop there and, and try and answer questions uh, if the audience has any questions. But I can then just sit here in, on the panel for a little while and then see if, if some questions come up. There can be two purposes to a letter of intent. One is it gives the program an idea of how many proposals they may receive in the for, for the full solicitation. I don't believe there are any programs where the letter of intent is, is a deciding factor of whether you can submit or not. I would make it no more than a page, and what you want to do is say, I'm intending to submit a proposal. You can put in the idea that you wish to address within the proposal very generally. But that's the purpose, as I understand it, of a letter of intent. So, so Bev, Bev uh, has it right. The main, one of the main goals is for program officers to know how many panels they're going to need and also know what conflicts of interest there might be. So once they have a pool of potential proposers, then they will go and figure out who might serve as panelists because 
they have to be independent of the pool of proposals. So this is one of the major uh, benefits that comes from having this letter of intent process is how many panels, who would be the potential reviewers who are not conflicted with, uh, with the potential proposers. Uh, sometimes it's a required, it's sometimes it's required. So you really don't want to then not submit the letter of intent and then write the proposal. So uh, that's the only other thing I would add. One of the things I would like to do is take a moment to introduce, allow our panelists to introduce themselves. So we've heard from both of our distinguished guests from the National Science Foundation. So if each of you could introduce yourself um, briefly, and then we can just go into questions that you can ask some of the former um, some career awardees. Um, well, first of all, I'd like to thank our uh, two guests for a very articulate and interesting discussion regarding NSF and the changes at NSF. Uh, my name is Ahmed al tawil I'm a professor in the Electrical Engineering and Computer Science Department at the Henry Samari School of Engineering. And uh, I received the Corona Award uh, a few years back, so I would uh, be happy to answer any of your questions. And I'm Alex Eiler. I'm in Computer Science. Uh, my area is Machine Learning and Artificial Intelligence, and I also took a few years back. So the question is, how long does it take to prepare a career award? Um, I think there's no right answer to that one. It really depends on, on your preparation. You get more than one shot to submit a career award. In my case, I got my career award on my second try. So I would say that the first time took uh, at least four months to prepare. On the second round, because I already gone through one round of reviews and I got some good feedback from the panel, even though the panels change, but still the essence of the reviews are good. So I used that into my second proposal, and that one took two months. So on average, I'd say maybe six months was how much time I invested in it. As I said, this is just a sample point, but I hope it's useful. Yeah, I would agree with that. I spent a lot of time thinking about it, and not, not that much, not six months writing it, but uh, uh, probably about two months writing it. Um, I got mine on my third try, and so the second one, uh, I reused a lot of ideas, and that was much, much easier. And then the third one, I threw everything out, and rewrote an uh, entirely new thing, so that took a little bit, a bit longer and a bit more thought, so. Actually, I have another comment too. Um, I think it's very important to know your audience, so know, spend some time thinking which directorate and which group of people are you planning to address. And specifically, uh, as Bev mentioned, read the solicitation so that you have a general understanding of what that directorate is dealing with and who are the people there and who would be the panels that they would invite so that you can uh, write the proposal in the right language. Um, I think another very important case, in, in, in uh, for me specifically, is really thinking of this as a career proposal in the sense that it's not just research, it's research and teaching. So in my case, and I think this might have been uh, uh, a bit weird because I didn't hear it in any other cases, the proposal came back to me and the program manager told me, well, the panel really likes your research proposal but they think that your teaching is just not very uh, innovative. So you have another opportunity to think about it and send us an addendum and explain to us really what you are planning to do in teaching. So I consider myself very lucky because it was not rejected based on that, right? So I went back and I thought about it and then I came back with a much more uh, elaborate plan on how I plan to have my teaching and research together uh, form that career plan. Um, so that, and then it went through. something that, that I heard another program officer talk about. Um, and it, go, it goes to back to that idea of career. The topic of your career proposal, should it be funded, will become what you are known for. So don't think, oh, this is the hot topic, I should be doing this. It should be something that you, and, and we know research directions kind of morph and change, but in general they stay about the same. Very few people make 
complete U-turns or left turns and right turns. So think, think about what it is you want to do for your career in terms of research. And that will be where your passion is, and that will come through in the proposal that you submit. One really good resource that is available for the first time is for our 2015 career awardees. We just published on our website what we are calling class of 2015. So it's, it's a PDF document with all 146 career winners with their pictures, with clickable links. So you can go there and click on anyone. It will take you to their uh, title, abstract, you know, intellectual merit, broader impact. So you can see in a snapshot very quickly who were successful in this year's round. And you can even, so it's organized by themes, you know, so like 10 themes across engineering. So you can say, okay, my field of work is say, energy. Then you can say, well, you know, how many people got awarded in the energy space, what kind of projects they were. It will give you a very quick idea of what kind of projects are people proposing successfully in the career program. You won't see the whole proposal, obviously, but at least you will get a very, very good snapshot of what it looks like with successful career awardees and who they are. Off the top of my head, that's a good question, and we will see if we can generate the data. You know, I don't, I don't think I've ever seen that kind of data. I can just tell you that the overall success rate in career program is about 17, 17 percent, 17, 18 percent. So, but I don't know the multi-year uh, success rate. That is a good question. Yes. <laughs> uh, my first trial was terrible. Um, and uh, the, the best thing that you can do is what happened to me after that, which is that I got invited out to be a reviewer on a, on a totally unrelated panel. Um, but uh, if you, you should seek out trying to do that because um, what that tells you is it, it shows you the distribution of proposals that come in. You get a really good idea of lots of different people's ideas of what a proposal should look like and what kinds of things should be included and how they were included and what detail. Um, and um, you also see the process and you see what the feedback that you're getting means. So you get a bunch of feedback from, from the panel on your review, but unless you've been on a panel, you don't really know how to process that, right? What is, what is good or very good and what does it mean that your broader impacts weren't strong enough? What, what do other people put into broader impacts? So being on a panel is, was, just completely changed my view of how I ought to write a proposal. Originally, I thought it was like writing a paper, which is totally wrong. Yeah, <laughs> you can't be wrong. <laughs> so um, in my case, again, I, I submitted first, and then I got some reviews back. And I think the major uh, issue that I had is that I was trying to explain a very complicated idea in a very complicated way, if that summarizes, that basically summarizes the feedback I got. Yes, this is an interesting idea, but the way I explained it in my first proposal was way too complicated. So I think as Bev, Bev uh, mentioned, it's very important in the first page or two pages, or at most three pages, to really state what your goals are and how you're going to achieve them in a nugget, right? So somebody who has a very small amount of time to read your proposal is able to understand what are you trying to achieve and why is it good and uh, a basic methodology of how you're going to do it. The rest of the proposal, the 12 pages or whatever, are to establish credibility, right? To establish that you're really the right person to do this, you have the tools, you have the, the right approach to make this successful. But if the first two to three pages do not summarize that and do not summarize that in a very clear, crisp way, then the proposal will be lost because people really don't have much time to read it. And that's what I tried to do in my second try. So in my second try, I didn't really change my content. It was exactly the same content. I just changed the way I perceive the content should be presented. And that made all the difference. So just to add one more, one more thing to that, um, I completely agree with what Bev said, that you're writing 
for many audiences at the same time on the panel, and that's another thing you'll see if you're there. There's one or two people who are really in your area and understand what you're doing and are experts, and then there's other people who maybe go to the same conferences as you but don't care about your problems, and then there's other people who don't even go to your conference but are just in your general area. And you need to be hitting all of those people and convincing all of them simultaneously. And that's a really hard balance to strike. So we're used to writing for people who are very close to us. So have unrelated people read it and make sure they understand it. And um, just try, you know, <laughs> try to have a broad spectrum of people look at it and give you their thoughts. Yeah. Another comment that I have is regarding the, the teaching part because that was where I, was, uh, I got my most criticism. It's expected that you're going to do your job, which is teach, write conference papers, and write journal papers. So that's not dissemination in, in, the, in the way the career wants to see it. So it wants you to really set the path where you say, over the next five years, I have an opportunity to work with students. How can I make their experience much more hands-on, much more interesting? How can I get them more engaged? How can I do outreach, not just to your students in the university, but to the community? You have high school, you have K through 12, you have students that, minorities that are not engaged. But rather than doing lip service to that, you have to have a plan, right? You have to say, this is my plan, this is what I'm going to do, this is how I'm going to outreach to, to different communities. And it's very difficult to get that in three pages, right? So, so you need to have a, a simple plan, right? The more complicated it is, the more, uh, well, difficult to convey it's going to be. So I think that was also a very important part that uh, must be part of a career proposal. And let me say this, um, I, I completely agree. If you plan on reaching out to a particular community, um, a particular group, a particular school or organization, and you don't have a letter of collaboration from that group, no one will believe you. No one will believe you. You can't, we are, um, we work in a, in a university environment. There's not many of us, us that know how to teach middle school students, how to interact and engage middle school students. So if that's what you want to do with your work, you want a partner that can help you, that can be that bridge, and you want to show that number one, that's not your field of expertise, but you've got somebody that can help you do it. And that's much more believable. So it's very important. Nothing annoys community college, and I'll just pick one, one group, community college faculty more than to have four-year university faculty say, and we're gonna do this with the community college students. Those are their students. Get a partner there. Get someone who agrees, I'm gonna help you engage with those students because I know who those students are and they know me and I can pave the way for you. It's very, very important. Just kind of amplifying on a couple of points. You, as junior faculty, you really want to leverage institutional resources. So when you're thinking about your teaching plan, you should be talking to your department chair, the curriculum committee of your department to see how your teaching ideas fit into what department wants to do in terms of its undergraduate mission or its graduate mission so that whatever you're planning to do has really strong resonance and support from, uh, from the leadership of the department and uh, senior faculty. That's on the education side. On outreach side, it's the same story. I mean, I'm sure UC Irvine has great resources in terms of connecting to community colleges or K through 12. So make sure that as you're formulating your ideas as to what you're going to do in those dimensions, you are first talking to the experts who are on your campus in, in your college so that you can learn from them what are the best opportunities, what are the biggest challenges they are facing so that maybe you can, your work could help solve one of those problems and that would be a very powerful proposal because you'll get letters of support that would speak to uh, And yeah, that, that's where it becomes a challenge. The letters of support cannot say, you know, we're going to bring them in and we're going to do this and do that. That's got to be in your proposal now. It's got to be in your proposal. But it's very important. Actually, if I may comment a little bit on the institutional support. We have a lot of institutional support at UCI. So there's the CAMP programs, the MESA programs. There's a, a Center for Educational Outreach, which its specific plan is actually to outreach to 
K through 12 and establish a uh, pathway to collaborate with teachers and so forth. So if you are uh, planning to write a, a proposal, it makes a lot of sense to go and understand these programs and maybe talk to their directors and get a letter from them because then that by proxy is a letter to the community colleges and schools and so forth. One of the things that I do at my institution is I make available the outreach and su student support programs that we offer within the College of Engineering at Virginia Tech. And I will bring people in because again, you want to, as, as Dr. Karganaga said, you want to leverage. You don't want to run a summer camp. Well, maybe you do, okay, maybe you do. You want to take your time and run a summer camp? I, I say have at it. But if you don't, if you don't want to worry about how do I recruit students, how do I engage students, how do I work with housing to get them housing, and how do they eat when they're here? If you don't want to worry about that, there are existing programs I know here at UC Irvine that would be happy to collaborate with you. And you can leverage what they do. I always tell people it's kind of then you become the bridegroom at the wedding. Okay, all you got to do is show up. Everything else is taken care of. I'm going to be mindful of time. I was actually trying to see if I could pull up a spreadsheet. I think most of you RSVP for this, so we have your email address. When we send out the survey, what we can do is um, for the School of Engineering and Information Computer Science, I pulled together a spreadsheet with many of the outreach programs that are on campus to help some of our faculty. So that's something that we could share with you all as well. And it's a, a um, really simple spreadsheet where it gives you the name of the organization, a link to their website, who their audience or population that they already work with and a point of contact so you can follow up with them because they're always looking for faculty, uh, graduate students, undergrads, postdocs to work with their programs, whether it's being um, teaching their students or creating new curriculum um, centered around your research or you even introducing some new research methods in your labs to their students. So I'll s we'll send that out to everyone. Um, at this I want to thank our guests from NSF and the panelists. Thank you so much. Um, this was really informative. I hope you all took away a lot from this. Uh, we do still probably have some refreshments outside. So if you want to go out and um, grab some refreshments, we have at 1130, I think a lot of you signed up for both. We have the campus presentation, Broadening Impact and NSF Perspective, and um, Bev Walker will continue the conversation, less focused on the proposal writing, but more focused on broader impact and what's going on with it. And I think a lot of us want to know what exactly is going on with, with broader impacts and how can we position ourselves to align with the National Science Foundation when we're submitting proposals. All right, thank you so much.